Welcome, listener. I'm glad you're here. Take a seat. Next to the fire. Welcome to Obscura, where we shine a light on the dark. Listener, how well do you remember your teenage years? Perhaps you reflect on this stage of your life with fondness and nostalgia, recalling your adolescence as a golden time when the world was ripe with possibilities. On the other hand, for some of us, the memories are foggy. This could be due to the passage of time, or because we looked forward to leaving the growing pains of adolescence behind us. The painful memories and long-term impacts of peer pressure, bullying, broken hearts, unrequited love, and general awkwardness aren't necessarily fun to reminisce about. But with the hindsight of adulthood, we're grateful we made it out the other side. We don't emerge totally unscathed, but we at least survived things. One adolescent rite of passage, where many of these key memories are formed, both good and bad, is parties. For many of us, parties during our teenage years often mark the many firsts in a young person's life. The first time we could drive after getting our license, our first kiss, the first time we experiment with cigarettes, alcohol, or harder drugs. For many teens, it's their first encounter with sex. Unfortunately for some girls, that encounter isn't always consensual but instead, traumatic. In those situations, we'd like to think that if we, or someone we knew, was raped or sexually assaulted at a party, the person responsible would be ejected and police contacted. Sadly, we know that in reality that doesn't happen for a range of reasons. It's a cold comfort, but on those occasions we hope that police will be contacted in the days following the attack in an attempt to bring the assailant to justice. But that can only happen if the survivor makes it home from the party in the first place. Now, let's get on with it. Part 1. Steel City The second oldest city in Australia is nestled on the east coast of New South Wales in the Hunter region a two-hour drive north of Sydney. Newcastle is a major beachside industrial center with a rich convict history. The city's coal mining, iron smelting, commercial fishing, and shipbuilding sectors established the settlement as a key contributor to Australia's effort in both world wars. Located on a peninsula to the northeast of the city is the maritime working-class suburb of Stockton, Originally known as Pirate's Point, Stockton is one of Australia's oldest colonial settlements, but didn't formally become part of Newcastle proper until 1938. Stockton is relatively geographically isolated from the rest of the city, surrounded by water in three directions. The port of Newcastle curves around the south, the Hunter River lies to the west, and the expanse of the Pacific Ocean stretches east. In 1971, the suburb of around 2,000 people acquired direct road access to the city center for the first time via the 23-kilometer Stockton Bridge. The suburb is also connected to the Newcastle CBD by a short ferry ride. For commuters, Stockton was conveniently a stone's throw away from Newcastle's BHP Steelworks on Gang Island, a man-made industrial site to the northwest. Since 1915, the BHP smokestacks were a looming feature of the suburb skyline until the plant closed in 1999. During this time, a large percentage of Stockton's male population worked at the complex, many for their entire working lives, and through generations. The suburb has a slightly higher rate of unemployment and lower incomes than many other Newcastle suburbs, 
which made life a little tougher. But these socioeconomic factors generally united the small, close-knit community rather than dividing it. Of course, this presented its own pros and cons. The hypermasculine working environment of heavy industry meant that gender roles in such working-class pockets of the city were traditionally conservative. Everyone knew everyone in the sleepy suburb. The main thoroughfare of Mitchell Street wasn't busy, but it was the hub of Stockton's social scene. Local teens congregated at Roberto's Pizza. Young people dropped in to play the store's video games as a means of alleviating the boredom. Another popular hangout for local adolescents was Stockton Beach. Dotted with sand dunes and salt bushes, the beach was also home to North Stockton Surf Club. Set against the picturesque backdrop of the Pacific Ocean, the clubhouse was the ideal setting for locals to host affordable functions and celebrations, like teenage birthday parties. Lee Mears was born on July 24, 1975, to her parents, Robin and Robert. During her early childhood, Lee lived with her maternal grandmother, attending various public and Catholic schools in the Newcastle area. By all accounts, Lee enjoyed school and was reported to be a cooperative student. Robin and Robert divorced in 1981, following an unhappy marriage. Robin started a relationship with David Lee, in 1983, the couple welcomed their daughter, Jessie. Lee moved back in with Robin, and with the arrival of her sister, Lee decided everyone should take on Jessie's surname, so everyone would know they were a family. Now known as Lee Lee, she liked the quirky edge to her new name, which set her apart. However, Robin's relationship wouldn't last, and she split from David in 1984. To soften the blow, Robin took Lee on a two-month holiday to Sri Lanka. Lee's father, Robert, had a Sri Lankan heritage, and Robin felt it was important her eldest daughter had a first-hand understanding of where she came from. In late 1985, Robin and her daughters moved to Stockton. The following year, she met a local auto electrician, Brad Shearman, and the pair commenced a de facto relationship. Even though Robin and Brad didn't marry... Lee's strong sense of family and desire for a permanent father figure saw her embrace Brad as her stepfather. In early 1989, the family of four moved from public housing in Stockton to Fern Bay, a short drive away. Robin worked at an aged care facility, and Lee was in 8th grade at Newcastle High School. Lee was very close with her maternal family, including her aunts and great-grandmother, who lived next door when Lee was growing up. Even after Lee returned to live with Robin and Jesse, she continued to visit her grandmother on weekends and during school holidays, maintaining the close bond they developed during Lee's early years. When Lee wasn't talking to her cousins on the phone, she spent most of her time hanging out with them, especially her cousin Tracy, who was also her best friend. The girls enjoyed going to the movies, roller skating, and spending every possible minute together on holidays. Spirited, loving, energetic, and forthright, Lee also had a love of horses and dreamt of one day becoming a vet. At school, she was friendly and got on well with anyone she met. All in all, Lee was a regular teenager and a happy kid. Part 2. Canary in a Coal Mine On the afternoon of Friday, November 3, 1989, 14-year-old Lee traveled home on the school bus with a girlfriend. The weekend had arrived, and the girls were excited about attending fellow student Jason Robertson's 16th birthday party. Later that evening, at North Stockton Surf Club, Lee and her friend had received written invitations to the party, along with about 40 other people. Lee felt privileged to be included especially considering most of the guests were in 10th grade at Newcastle High School. 
Lee had a crush on the vocalist of the teenage band, which was providing live music for the night. The invitation stated the party would run from 7 p.m. until dawn. But Robin was firm that Lee could only stay up until 11 p.m. The plan was for Brad to collect Lee and her girlfriend who would return to Lee's house for a sleepover. Robin was understandably anxious about her eldest daughter attending her first teenage party. Like many parents, Robin was trying to strike a balance between not being unnecessarily restrictive while at the same time setting reasonable boundaries. Besides, Lee was bursting with excitement and had assured Robin that there would be adult supervision at the party. In her book, Who Killed Lee Lee?, Associate Professor Carrie Carrington explains that Brad had some reservations about the invitation, which specified that guests bring their own alcohol, but he reluctantly agreed with Robin that this was an opportunity for Lee to demonstrate that she could be trusted going out on her own. It would be a fun night out with her friends, and she'd be home at a reasonable hour. Later that afternoon, after getting off the bus, Lee's friend got ready and walked to Lee's house, arriving at around 4.45 p.m. Once Lee was ready, Robin drove the girls to the surf club at around 6.30 p.m. Lee was sure to take along her invitation in the pocket of her shorts. When the girls arrived, the band was already setting up, but there weren't a lot of people there. Robin instead dropped the girls at Roberto's Pizza, which was supplying the party with food and soft drinks. Lee and her girlfriend met up with other guests at the pizza shop before walking a short distance to the surf club. Arriving between 7.30 and 8 p.m., as the sun set, more guests arrived. Milling around the entrance to the surf club and several wooden picnic tables on a grassed area outside. 18-year-old local man, Matthew Webster, acted as a bouncer at the party. He was unemployed, having dropped out of high school at age 16. Matthew had completed a pre-apprenticeship course with hopes of becoming a mechanic, but a job was yet to materialize. Overweight and with a chubby face, he was known around Stockton by his nickname, Fat Matt. 19-year-old Guy Wilson was also unemployed and another bouncer at the party. Guy and Matthew had been friends since their early teens, having played football together. At the party, both men were to collect a $2 cover charge from male guests. There was no charge for girls. The men were also expected to break up any fights and clean out empty beer bottles. Apart from another male guest, Matthew and Guy were the only people of legal drinking age at the party. The host Jason asked the other 18-year-old man to purchase alcohol for Lee and two of her girlfriends. The man drove the girls to one of the local pubs where they gave him $15 to purchase a bottle of bourbon. The group then drove back to the party. After mixing their bourbon with a bottle of cola, Lee and her two girlfriends sat outside on one of the picnic tables and started drinking. Lee's friends noticed that she drank quite quickly. At around 8.30 p.m., two of the girls headed inside the surf club, where the band was playing. But Lee went for a walk. By this stage, more guests had arrived. One later stated that he was approached by Matthew Webster, who said, Hey dude, we're going to get Lee pissed and I'll go through her. Not long after, two police officers arrived to check on the party. Not wanting to be sprung for underage drinking, guests under 18 scrambled to hide their beer bottles or made a run for the salt bushes on the beach. Lee was said to be so intoxicated by this stage that she was having trouble standing up. Three guests took her outside to avoid attracting police attention. The last thing anyone wanted was for the party to be shut down, but the officers didn't note anything of concern and spoke to the band inside the surf club before leaving. Several guests noticed that Lee was still wandering around, heavily intoxicated, she was seen talking to several boys on a number of occasions throughout the night, including Guy Wilson, Matthew Webster, and a 15-year-old boy who cannot be named for legal reasons, but whom we shall call Nathan. Soon after the police left, Lee wandered inside the surf club and approached the band's vocalist, whom she had a crush on. Despite the fact the band was playing, 
Lee tried to talk to the vocalist over the top of the music. He tried to ignore Lee, but the pair were soon seen to be arguing, and Lee yelling, I hate you. I'm going to get with every boy here. Spurned by the object of her affections, Lee stormed off to sin talk with other boys in the surf club, one of whom was Nathan. Not long afterwards, Nathan was overheard talking about Lee, telling Matthew and Guy, I'm going to go and fuck her. Witnesses saw Lee and Nathan outside the surf club, heading down to the beach to the salt bushes. However, Lee was so intoxicated she could barely walk, and Nathan had to almost carry her. Between approximately 9 and 9.30 p.m., Lee was seen stumbling up towards the surf club from the direction of the beach. She was extremely upset, crying to the point of being inconsolable. She was also bleeding between her legs. A male guest said Lee approached him, repeatedly wailing, Nathan fucked me. I'm bleeding. I think I'm pregnant. I hate him. In her distress, Lee kept falling over and was still having trouble walking. Some male guests guided her to picnic tables closer to the beach in an effort to calm her down. One male guest said Lee yelled out, Nathan fucked me, then started vomiting. Two female guests came over, moving Lee to another picnic table where they too attempted to comfort her. One of the girls went to the surf club to find out who Nathan was. When the girl told Jason what happened, he rebuffed her, responding that Nathan wouldn't do such a thing. By this stage, Lee had clambered off the table and staggered over to the surf club where she lay down on a seat outside. She had a brief conversation with one of the boys who had previously tried to comfort her. The two female guests who had tried to help Lee left the party. Soon after, Lee was seen laying on the ground near a picnic table outside the surf club. A group of up to ten boys, alleged to include Jason, Guy, Nathan, and Matthew, had surrounded Lee. They laughed as they poured beer on her, called her names, spat on her, and kicked her. Lee lay on her side with her knees pulled up towards her stomach, trying to shrink away from the boys surrounding her, yelling at them to leave her alone. One boy heard Matthew call Lee a silly slut. Guys joined in. The two men telling Lee, Get up, you dumb bitch. You're a slut and a whore. Piss off, you slut. One member of the group later told police, I was standing with all the boys around her, and I was laughing, and I thought it was funny to see what they were doing. By pouring beer over her and spitting at her, Lee was just lying on the ground moaning and rubbing her fingers through her hair, where the beer was being poured on her. This looked funny at the time. That's why I stayed and watched. Two female guests who realized what was happening intervened, telling the group of boys to stop. The girls picked Lee up, placing her on a picnic table, but Lee got up and staggered away. She picked up an empty beer bottle which she threw at the boys, but the bottle missed the group and smashed in the corner of the surf club. Guy was seen throwing his bottle at Lee which hit her in the leg. She yelled at him to fuck off before picking up another empty beer bottle and throwing it at the ground, smashing it. Still unsteady on her feet, Lee made her way inside the surf club, but the group of boys, including Matthew and Guy, followed her. Lee sat on a chair inside with her head down. She was pale, wet, and covered in dirt. The boys came over and continued their assault for several more minutes, spitting on her, pouring beer over her and calling her a slut, a mole, and a bitch. By this stage, it was 10.20 p.m., and the band was packing up. The boys sat together, talking, while Lee got up and walked out of the surf club, still crying. As she left, Guy approached her and asked her for sex. Lee refused, pushing Guy away, but he pushed her back. Lee was then seen stumbling down the path towards the beach. Around 10 minutes later, Matthew and Guy followed her.
Lee's stepfather, Brad, arrived at the party at around 10.50 p.m. to take Lee and her girlfriend home. Being a realist, he suspected there would be some alcohol at the party, definitely cigarettes, and probably some marijuana. But what he saw shocked him. As he got closer to the surf club, he saw someone asleep in the gutter. Guests were stumbling around on the beach and outside the surf club, heavily intoxicated. Some were vomiting into the salt bushes. Brad saw at least 15 cases of beer laying around. Lee's girlfriend was there, but there was no sign of Lee, who her girlfriend told Brad she hadn't seen in an hour or so after they arrived at the party. Another girl told Brad she saw Lee walking home. Brad and several guests searched for Lee, but she was nowhere to be found. Brad waited in his car at the surf club for another 30 minutes until he finally decided to return home around midnight. Brad was angry, but after he'd calmed down and mulled it over further with Robin, he headed back to the surf club a second time, where he saw some guests still milling about, but no Lee. The book, Who Killed Lee Lee, details how when Brad returned, several guests told him that Lee had been targeted and assaulted earlier in the evening by Matthew, Guy, and Nathan. Brad drove to Roberto's Pizza, where he saw Lee's girlfriend. The pair drove around Stockton for 30 minutes looking for Lee, but had no luck. Brad dropped Lee's girlfriend off at home at around 1 a.m., and he headed home to check in with Robin. By now, the couple were worried. Rather than both sitting at home waiting, Brad headed out, again to the surf club. This time, he spotted the vocalist from the band who told him that Lee had been upset earlier that evening, and he last saw Lee walking off towards the northern end of the beach by herself. Brad drove back into the main part of Stockton to search again, before heading home to swamp vehicles. Taking his three-wheeled motorcycle, he rode along the beach for an hour in the darkness, hoping to find Lee asleep or passed out in the salt bushes. Unsuccessful, he returned to the surf club before heading home at around 3 a.m. Brad and Robin told themselves that Lee must have stayed at a friend's house and hoped she'd come home or call the following morning. At 7 a.m. the next day, Brad and several guests recommenced the search. Brad drove into Stockton before heading to the beach. Robin called Jason's parents to tell them that Lee hadn't come home and Jason soon turned up to join the search. At around 9.30 a.m., Jason saw what he thought was a mannequin lying in the sand dunes near salt bushes, about 92 meters north of the surf club. Brad noticed the group of searchers congregating near the bushes and raced over. Jumping off of his motorcycle, he started to cry when he saw what they'd found. It wasn't a mannequin, it was Lee's body. She was naked except for her socks and shoes, and her underwear and shorts were entangled around her right ankle. Lee was lying on her back with her legs apart and pulled up. Her bra lay in the sand two meters away from her left foot, and the securing hook was bent. Her short sleeve top and jumper, which lay intertwined inside out nearby, smelled of alcohol. A blood-stained rock weighing 5.6 kilograms lay 40 centimeters to the left of Lee's head. The salt bush and sand around her head were heavily stained with blood, with stains extending up to 2.8 meters from her body. Salt bushes in the immediate vicinity had been flattened, as if there had been a prolonged and intense struggle. The left side of Lee's head had sustained horrific injuries, and her genital area had also been bleeding. Some form of liquid had been poured on or run down the blood-soaked areas of Lee's body, diluting the red stains. It couldn't have been rain, as there hadn't been any in Stockton the previous evening. Blood had sprayed such a considerable distance that it would have been impossible for whoever killed Lee to have escaped without also being covered in blood. The invitation to the party was still in her pocket,
Obscura is supported by Handy. This time of year, the two scariest words on everyone's mind, aside from tax season, are spring cleaning. As if you don't already have a million things on your to-do list, now you have to sacrifice an entire Saturday deep cleaning your home. Thanks to Handy, there's a better way to knock out spring cleaning. Handy is the easy and convenient way to book your home cleanings on a schedule that works for you. I used Handy to book my spring cleaning, and let me tell you, it took less than two minutes to book. Handy will match you with a top-rated pro in your area, or you can choose who you want to work with. You can even compare your profiles and read real customer reviews. Choose a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly plan. Handy schedules your reoccurring bookings to make things easy. What you see is what you pay. Pay securely on the app. No need to worry about cash or checks. You can even tip your pro directly on the app. And no need to worry. 100% of the tips go directly to the pros. And hey, if you're not satisfied with the quality of the service, they'll book another pro to make it right and no extra charge. Listener, Andy has a special limited time offer. Get your first three-hour cleaning for only $29 when you sign up for a cleaning plan. Go to handy.com slash obscura and enter promo code obscura. That's a three-hour home cleaning for $29 with a cleaning plan at handy.com slash obscura, promo code obscura. Terms and conditions apply. Visit Handy's website for more information. Handy, the most reliable name in-house cleaning. Obscura is supported by Native. Did you know that many conventional deodorants contain aluminum, which forms a plug in your sweat glands to keep you from sweating? Native's deodorant is made without aluminum, so you can feel better about what you're putting on your body. It's also vegan and never tested on animals. Native deodorant is made with ingredients you've heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. You wear deodorant every day. Shouldn't you be able to understand the ingredients list? And making the switch to an aluminum-free deodorant does not mean you have to sacrifice on performance. Native will keep you smelling and feeling fresh all day long. With over 10 scents, including their classics and rotating seasonals, you're guaranteed to find one you love. And it's no risk to try. Free shipping on every order, and Native offers 30-day free returns and exchanges in the USA. Personally, my wife really enjoys the scent Lavender and Rose. Native is excited for the relaunch of their toothpaste line. Most natural toothpaste feel like natural toothpaste during brushing. Gritty, little to no foaming, limited freshening power, and without the clean mouth feeling you expect after brushing your teeth. Native's toothpaste use a special blend of naturally derived cleansers, flavors, and whiteners to deliver a great brushing experience without the trade-offs of other natural toothpastes. Native's natural toothpaste can do it all. It whitens teeth, freshens breath, is enamel safe, and prevents cavities. It's made without triclosan, sulfates, artificial preservatives, or parabens. Basically, not good stuff. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code OBSCURA during checkout. Again, for 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code OBSCURA during checkout. Part 3. Talk of the Town The post-mortem found that Lee had been struck in the head at least three times with a blunt object, using considerable force. She sustained asphyxial hemorrhaging, multiple injuries to her knees, jaws, ribs, liver, lower spine, and a kidney. Fingertip pressure bruises on her neck indicated she had also been choked before she died. Lee's blood alcohol reading was 0.128. At this level of intoxication, most people experience reduced reaction time, slurred speech, a decrease in thinking and reasoning abilities, poor physical coordination, and vomiting. This was consistent in what guests later reported about Lee's presentation throughout the night. Lee had sustained severe injuries to her genitals. There was deep bruising to the left wall of her vagina, which extended to her hymen. 
There was also two tears to a revolver, one measuring 20 millimeters long. No semen was found in her body. The nature of the injuries indicated that she had been violently sexually assaulted. The cause of death was a fractured skull, resulting from the blows to her head. Detective Sergeant Lance Chaffee of Newcastle Police headed the investigation. Having so many potential witnesses was a blessing, but could also be a curse. A wealth of information was potentially available. However, the likelihood of party guests cooperating was another question entirely. Even if witnesses provided reliable and consistent accounts, many of the guests weren't wearing watches on that night. In the days before cell phones, it was unlikely that many of the partygoers would have paid much attention to the time. And unlike teenage parties of today, they certainly wouldn't have been able to exchange messages, take photos, or post on social media pages, having the benefit of timestamping to help corroborate information. By November 5th, police interviewed around 40 teenagers, announcing that they expected to interview at least 20 more. A sinister picture of the guest list was emerging. Witnesses told police that Lee was one of several underage girls who were invited to the party, not based on popularity, but so the boys could get them drunk and have sex with them. These younger girls were referred to in local parlance as baldies, which was a slang term for girls without pubic hair. Among those interviewed by police on November 5th were 15-year-old Nathan, Matthew Webster, and Guy Wilson. In the state of New South Wales, even if both parties are consenting, it's illegal for anyone to engage in sexual activity with someone under the age of 16. During questioning, police had to explain the concept of consent to Nathan. The 15-year-old told police that Lee asked him to go down to the beach, where they sat down and started kissing. He admitted to having sex with Lee for about five minutes, but claimed it was consensual. He also admitted to having sex later in the evening with another of Lee's underage friends. Nathan told police that he and two other guests left the party around midnight to go swimming at Raymond Terrace, a small town a half hour drive north of Stockton. Just before leaving the party, Nathan noticed Guy asleep in the car near the surf club. He later returned home at 3 a.m. Nathan agreed to provide police with a blood sample and the clothes he wore on the night of the party. He also agreed to show them where he had sex with both Lee and later her girlfriend. Guy told police that in the hours before the party, he went to a local pub around mid-afternoon, where he had a few drinks before heading to the surf club, arriving at around 5.30 p.m., he told police that when he first spoke to Lee in the early evening, he didn't see her consume any alcohol. However, around 7.30 p.m., he saw her inside of the surf club, heavily intoxicated. Guy and a female guest drove into Stockton to purchase some bourbon, then returned to the party. Guy told police he retrieved his beers from outside the surf club, then headed inside to continue drinking. Eventually feeling tired, he tried to sleep in a friend's car, but it was locked, so he fell asleep in the gutter. A friend came and woke him up and drove him home, where Guy went to bed. Guy denied any involvement in the group assault on Lee. Police seized the shirt Guy wore on the night of the party, which he admitted had a blood stain on it from shaving. In Matthew Webster's interview, he told police that he'd first met Lee around 18 months previously, through a friend's girlfriend, and the group socialized together. On the day of the party, Matthew went to a friend's house. The pair got ready in the afternoon, then headed into Stockton to purchase cartons of beer for the night ahead. Matthew and some of his friends caught a ride to the party from another friend who was driving past Roberto's Pizza. When the group arrived, the host Jason instructed they store the cartons of beer in the salt bushes, leading down to the beach outside the surf club. Matthew told police he started drinking soon after arriving at the party. He stated that around 9 p.m. he saw Lee and Nathan cuddling and kissing, adding, Some other people told me they had seen Nathan and Lee in the bushes screwing. After Lee returned from the beach later in the evening, Matthew stated, 
She was running around crying, and she shot through somewhere. She was running around saying that she was pregnant. Matthew recalled being drunk and singing along to the band inside the surf club before they packed up. He told police he left the party at 10.30 p.m. and made his way to a local pub. He then walked to Roberto's Pizza where he met up with a group of partygoers around 10 minutes later. Matthew said he walked home, arriving around 11 p.m. He watched some TV and fell asleep. He told police that the next morning, he went to Nathan's house where he asked his friend if he had sex with Lee. But Nathan said he didn't. Matthew admitted to pouring beer over Lee later in the evening, but denied sexually assaulting or killing her. He also denied having any knowledge of anyone else doing such things. But he did tell detectives that he'd heard two rumors about who was responsible. One rumor was that two men in a panel van were the culprits. The other was Lee had been attacked by an older man. Matthew agreed to provide police with the clothing he wore on the night of the party. A number of rumors quickly circulated about who was responsible. Among the allegations was the claim that Lee's stepfather, Brad, was the killer, and that he had been having a sexual relationship with Lee over the course of several months. When he arrived to pick her up from the party, so the theory went, Brad killed Lee in a fit of anger after discovering that she'd had sex with Nathan. The rumor was repeated so often and with such certainty that police couldn't initially rule out Brad as a suspect. Police conducted an extensive interview with him the day after Lee's body was discovered and seized the clothes Brad had wore during his initial search for Lee. Another rumor was the one Matthew told police about in his first interview. Two men from outside Stockton were said to be responsible. This couldn't initially be ruled out. Extensive media coverage of the crime focused on the lack of parental supervision at the party, drug and alcohol use amongst the guests, and Lee's behavior on the night. The strong belief circulating amongst the community was that Lee had placed herself at risk and made a gross error of judgment in going down to the beach with Nathan. Many locals felt Lee was too young to have attended the party in the first place. The idea that Lee somehow deserved what happened to her and gossip about her reputation was rife at Newcastle High School. A month after the murder, graffiti was scrawled in the girl's bathroom saying, Suck shit, Lee Lee. But as inquiries progressed, the feeling grew amongst the police, Stockton residents, and Lee's friends and family that the killer or killers had been at the party. At her funeral on November 9th, Lee was remembered in her eulogy as easy to get along with with a sense of adventure. Tearful mourners filed after her coffin as it left the church. Accompanied by the share song, if I Could Turn Back Time, which was one of Lee's favorites. At her burial at Stockton Cemetery, Lee's friends threw red roses on top of the coffin as it was lowered into the ground. Police quickly eliminated Brad's alleged involvement and the theory that men from outside Stockton were responsible when no further evidence was forthcoming. But the nature of the conversations about Lee at the party between Nathan, Matthew, and Guy and the nature of their interactions with her at various times during the evening compelled police to go back over the trio's initial statements. Information from other witnesses independently corroborated the boy's behavior towards Lee and placed them with her at key points throughout the evening. Matthew, Nathan, and Guy had already been interviewed, but police now focused their attention on them more closely. An inconsistency in Matthew's story related to his claim, he arrived home at 11 p.m. Matthew had walked part of the way home with one of the boys he met outside Roberto's Pizza after the party. The boy told police that Matthew walked up the street towards the pizza shop around 10.30 to 10.45 p.m., telling the group he just had a beer at a local pub. The boy told police he arrived home just before midnight, but this contradicted Matthew's account. 
Matthew and the boy had walked home in the same direction, yet there was almost an hour that Matthew hadn't accounted for. On November 15th, 12 days after Lee's murder, police arrested Nathan on Mitchell Street for the purposes of questioning. At the station, he was questioned about Lee being sexually assaulted and charged with sexual intercourse with a child between ages 10 to 16. Under New South Wales law, this was a separate and lesser charge compared to sexual assault. But Nathan wasn't questioned about Lee's murder, nor was he charged with having sex with her underage girlfriend. Matthew was arrested in Stockton the same day as Nathan for questioning regarding Lee's murder. Matthew had previously told police he went to a local pub for a drink after the party, but he now changed his story, telling them he went for a walk instead. The same day, Nathan and Matthew were detained. Guy Wilson was on his way home from the pub when police approached him. He voluntarily agreed to accompany them to the station for questioning. Guy, too, provided a slightly different version of events compared to his first interview. He told police that late in the evening at the party, he saw Lee stumble into the surf club. She was still heavily intoxicated and appeared unwell. The guy claimed he showed her how to vomit to make herself feel better. Guy said Matthew approached him and said, Nathan's already had two roots, one with Lee, and she's a bit of a slut. Why don't all of us have a go? Guy now admitted to pouring beer over Lee, spitting on her, and throwing an empty beer bottle at her. He also admitted to putting his arm around Lee and asking her for sex as she walked outside the surf club. When Lee refused and pushed Guy away, he pushed her back, causing her to fall to the ground. Guy claimed he last saw Lee around 10.30 p.m., stumbling down a path towards the beach. He reiterated that he collected his remaining beers from the salt bushes before going to a friend's car to sleep, which was parked at the surf club. Guy told police the car was locked, so he slept in the gutter until a friend woke him up sometime after 11.30 p.m. to take him home. But this contradicted witness statements, including Nathan's, that Guy was seen asleep in his friend's car outside the surf club at around midnight. Guy and Matthew were charged with assault, occasioning actual bodily harm for pouring beer on Lee, spitting on her, throwing a beer bottle at her, and pushing her. But nothing in the charges mentioned the alleged sexual assault or murder. Once charged, the trio were free to go until they were due to appear in court. Part 4. Caught in a Rip On November 17th, Matthew and Guy appeared in court to answer the assault charges. Matthew pleaded guilty and his sentencing was scheduled for February 21st the following year. Both men were released on bail. Guy's court date was adjourned to January 19th when he pleaded guilty to assaulting Lee and was again released on bail. Ten days later... The Newcastle Herald newspaper reported that Matthew assaulted a teenage boy in the car park of Stockton Ferry Terminal. The boy was in a group of four youths who had antagonized Matthew about the murder. In response to the group's taunts, Matthew punched the teenager, sending him through a car window. Matthew pulled the boy out of the car and continued punching him. But Matthew wasn't the only one finding himself a target. Lee's family was being threatened and intimidated by some Stockton residents. This campaign of harassment culminated on January 31st, 1990, when Lee's stepfather Brad approached Guy Wilson on a Stockton street. Guy sneered at Brad the next time he'd quote, Get Lee's sister Jessie. Brad punched Guy in the head three times, breaking his nose. Brad was charged with assault and released on bail. Robin Lee was also struggling. For months following the murder, she could hardly bear to walk into her eldest daughter's bedroom, and when she could, she would sit on the bed and cry. In an interview with ABC Radio National, Robin spoke about the aftermath of losing her daughter and the resulting fear and isolation. There were very few people that stuck by me 
very few. But I found a lot of people blamed me for moving into the area. If I hadn't moved there, it wouldn't have happened. Um, those poor boys were being harassed. She got what she deserved. In general, not a very good response whatsoever. Um, I was a bit shocked, actually, because I couldn't understand what I or, or my daughter had done to um, deserve the treatment. My youngest daughter had to pull her out of school because of the abuse she was getting in kindergarten from other students. Um, well, after going to the police for a bit of help and <laughs> told that um, there was nothing that they could do, I, you know, like, how can anyone in that situation stay somewhere where they don't feel safe? My house had been broken into um, of a night time. Louts, that's, <laughs> that's the only way I can describe them would come around and harass around the house. Um, if I run into them in, in public, um, I was abused, spat at, and just generally not, not treated very nice at all. Robin continued to wait for news about who would be held accountable for at least sexual assault and murder. Police had assured her that all parties involved would be brought to account and feel the full force of the law. But even though Matthew, Guy, and Nathan were awaiting sentencing for the minor assault offenses and the lesser sex offense, nothing else happened. Detectives openly blamed the community's reluctance to talk. However detailed, corroborating information provided by numerous eyewitnesses contradicted the claim that stonewalling by the community caused a delay in the investigation. Then, on February 16, 1990, Matthew Webster was arrested while still on bail for the lesser assault charge. Two police officers escorted him to the station for questioning about Lee's murder. Guy Wilson was also at the police station when they arrived, but had attended voluntarily. Matthew and Guy were interviewed by Detective Chaffee separately about the events on the night of the party. The suspects were then left to talk together in an interview room where a listening device had been installed to record their conversation. After an hour, Matthew and Guy were separated and again interviewed. Guy's version of events remained largely unchanged. However, he now claimed that when he retrieved his beers from the salt bushes late in the evening... He didn't see Lee at all. He was released without charge. Matthew told police that not long after arriving at the party, he went and smoked some cannabis with Guy and Nathan. Matthew was inside the surf club listening to the band when he saw Lee stagger inside. Distressed and claiming she was pregnant, he told police, I got the shits with it, and I pushed her away and told her to piss off but he denied calling her names. The record of Matthew's police interview then revealed that out of nowhere, he dropped a bombshell saying, Well, I did it, but I just couldn't believe it happened. It's just unbelievable. When police asked Matthew to recount his movements from late in the evening, he said, I went to look for my beers and I saw Lee sitting down on the grass. My beers weren't there. Somebody must have pinched them. Then I walked up to Lee, and she carried on with her normal shit, and I tried to get onto her. Then I walked down to the bushes. I think I had her down and had my hand across her throat, so she couldn't make any noise. She started crawling away, and I grabbed her by the feet and pulled her back. I pulled her clothes off, and I pulled my shorts down, and I put my finger in her pussy. Thought I was right for a root, and then she started pushing me away, saying don't. I lost my temper, and I did what I did. She was punching and pushing. I grabbed her by the throat, and she said don't. I choked her for a bit, but I stopped, because I didn't think it was working. She stopped punching, and I grabbed the rock and killed her. When police asked Matthew why he killed Lee, he said, 
I didn't want to get into trouble, if you can believe that. I thought she would squeal on me for trying to rape her. I was laying on top of her, but she was punching and pushing and saying not to. I picked the rock up and went back and hit her with it. I'm just so, so, so sorry. I would do anything to go back in time, so it would not happen. I feel like a cunt. Matthew couldn't recall exactly how many times he threw the rock at Lee's head, saying, I can't remember. I just freaked out. I was spinning out. All these things were going through my head, and I bolted. Matthew told police that after he killed Lee, he walked around Stockton before going to a boat ramp to wash Lee's blood off his hands. He then headed back to Roberto's Pizza, where he met up with a group of boys before walking home around 11 p.m. Matthew was charged with maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm with intent to have sexual intercourse and murder, but he was not asked whether he had acted alone or if others were involved. Police contacted Lee's mother, Robin, with the good news. Matthew had not only been charged, but he confessed. There would be no trial. The case was closed, but the wave of relief that immediately washed over Robin was very quickly replaced with one of confusion, then anger. Matthew was the only person charged with a serious sex offense and murder. Police had led Robin to believe that more than one person had sexually assaulted Lee. Now they were telling the distraught mother that no one else would be charged with anything. This wasn't the outcome Robin had been promised. It just reopened painful emotional wounds all over again. Matthew appeared in court three days after he was charged. He was refused bail. Nathan was sentenced ten days later after pleading guilty to sexual intercourse with a child between the ages of 10 and 16. He received six months in juvenile detention. On March 19th, Guy was convicted of sexual occasioning actual bodily harm and sentenced to six months in jail. On March 21st, while in custody, Matthew was convicted for the assault at the ferry terminal car park in late January and fined $250 for offensive behavior. Seven weeks later, Nathan appealed his sentence, which was reduced to 100 hours of community service. The judge upheld the appeal on the basis that his assessment of the evidence was that Nathan and Lee had consensual sex. Despite the many witness statements contradicting this view, Nathan was released. At Matthew's committal hearing on May 22nd, the police brief of evidence included one of two post-mortem reports. As explained in the book, Who Killed Lee Lee? The report that wasn't included was more comprehensive and contained forensic evidence contradicting Matthew's confession. This related to the way Matthew claimed he strangled Lee and evidence indicating Lee was hit in the head from several directions instead of one. The more detailed report also noted, It is much more probable that an inflexible object such as a beer bottle, as distinct from a flexible object such as a finger or a penis, caused the majority of the genital injuries. This statement contradicted Matthew's account that he penetrated Lee with only his finger. Matthew's confession and the report also conflicted with the lack of blood on his clothing afterwards. The day following the murder, Matthew's mother washed the clothes her son had worn to the party. She later expressed surprise at how clean they were, given the blood splatter which would have been expected if Matthew was the sole killer. There was simply no way that the severity of Lee's injuries would have resulted in Matthew only having bloody hands. And why, with the Pacific Ocean 100 meters away from the murder site, did Matthew walk to a boat ramp some distance away to wash his hands? For Lee's family, the way things were unfolding made them extremely uneasy. But the matter wouldn't return to court for another five months. Lee's family maintained the slim hope that further charges would be laid against other individuals in the interim. But it wasn't looking good. In early June, Lee's stepfather, Brad, received a 12-month good behavior bond for his assault on Guy Wilson back in late January. No conviction was recorded given the provocation involved, but Lee's death took its toll on Robin and Brad's relationship. 
and sadly, the couple split up three months later. Vigilanteism continued in Stockton. In August 1990, someone threw a Molotov cocktail into Guy Wilson's house, burning the property to the ground. Police interrogated Lee's father, Robert, over the attack, but there was nothing to prove his involvement. This pressure was the last thing the devastated father needed. Nine months earlier, Robert had taken the painful task of identifying Lee's body at the morgue. But instead of the passage of time alleviating Robert's pain, it seemed to intensify it. He found himself unable to escape the memory of his mutilated daughter, laid out before him. Driven to despair and overwhelmed with grief, Robert attempted to take his own life almost a year after Lee's murder. He survived, later telling the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, Life sucked. I wanted to escape. I wanted to die. My life has changed so much. I've become aggressive. There's so much hatred and hurt inside me that it frightens even me. People don't understand that. No one can understand it but me. In October 1990, Matthew Webster returned to court and pleaded guilty to Lee's murder. The court heard that on the night of the party, Matthew smoked 15 cones of marijuana and drank around 24 beers. Five family friends of Webster's voluntarily gave character references for Matthew, describing him as a gentle giant. But the nature of the plea meant no evidence was tested and no witnesses were called. In his sentencing remarks, the judge explained Matthew's motivation for killing Lee by referring to a psychologist's report, quoting, Matthew attacked Lee, not so much because she would not let him have sex with her, but because she became the living proof that even a slut, the property of the clan, thought he was not good enough to have sex with. It is for this reason that he proceeded to strangle her. All the pent-up rage which Matthew had managed to control for most of his life was unleashed, not only by the drugs and alcohol, but by what he perceived to be an extreme rejection. The judge described Matthew as a gentle, shy, and polite young man, lacking in self-confidence, who behaved with uncharacteristic and impulsive ferocity, and was a first-time offender of otherwise good character. This assessment of Matthew as a first-time offender appeared to disregard his previous conviction for assaulting the teenager in the car park. The judge was openly critical of what he perceived as a lack of paternal supervision. Echoing popular media sentiment, he said, Every parent involved really wears this on their conscience. It is entirely reprehensible that this party should have been allowed to take place without adult supervision to prevent the unlawful abuse of alcohol and drugs and the considerable amount of promiscuous sexual activity which took place between a large number of teenagers present. The judge told the court he felt a life sentence wasn't appropriate for Matthew. Taking into account Matthew's plea, his age, and potential for rehabilitation, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison with a 14-year non-parole period. Outside court, Robert Lee told reporters, I feel numb. The judge could have given him 100 years and I probably wouldn't have thought it was enough. My little girl is dead. Nothing can bring her back. Listener, you may have noticed that there was no mention of the sexual assault charge at Matthew's sentencing. You'd be right to wonder what happened for it to disappear. Police had initially charged Matthew with maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm with intent to have sexual intercourse. However, at sentencing, the court didn't hear about the severe genital injuries Lee sustained prior to her death. But we'll get to that later in the story. Robin had been campaigning since Matthew's arrest for the case to be officially reinvestigated. Now with the sexual assault charges against Matthew not proceeding, and the case seemingly finalized, it just added to Robin's anguish and indignation. To the Lee family, it looked like a deal had been struck. When Robin later asked Detective Chaffee in a radio interview why no charges were laid against others who were said to be involved, he responded, Do you know how much it costs to run an investigation? 
In 1991, Matthew appealed the length of his prison term, but was unsuccessful. It was a relief for Lee's family to know that Matthew would serve his original sentence, but the inconsistencies between his confession and the forensic and eyewitness evidence only added to Robin's suspicions that police had taken shortcuts in an effort to close the case. By 1992, everything became too much. Robin and Jesse were experiencing continual harassment in Stockton. Eventually, being driven out of their home and away from their family. Part 5. Against the Tide Desperate for some sort of formal acknowledgement of the full scale of abuse her daughter suffered, Robin applied to the state government for victims' compensation. No amount of money would bring Lee back or possibly alleviate the pain her family was experiencing. But in May 1993, Robin and Jesse were awarded almost $30,000. Robin continued to hold out hope that the case would be reinvestigated. In early 1994, an academic from the University of Newcastle published an article on the case. Associate Professor Kerry Carrington was critical of Newcastle Police's handling of the investigation, including the minimal number of arrests and nature of the subsequent convictions and sentences. Despite several boys confessing to attacking Lee, only Matthew and Guy Wilson were charged with assault. The man who admitted to supplying Lee with alcohol at the party was never charged. Associate Professor Carrington also had concerns about what happened to the blood samples and clothing taken from the primary suspects for testing. She claimed that around 1993, a detective told her that none of the suspects' clothing that was seized by police was sent for testing. But there was no explanation as to why. After reading the article, Robin reached out to Associate Professor Carrington in her hope to have the case reopened. After speaking with Robin... In August 1994, Associate Professor Carrington sent out a submission to the Wood Royal Commission into police corruption and misconduct. In Australia, royal commissions are usually run by a judge and are the highest form of inquiry on a range of matters that are in the public interest. This particular royal commission was headed by Justice James Wood, the very same judge who was critical of the lack of parental supervision at the party and sentenced Matthew Webster. Associate Professor Carrington asserted that the forensic pathologist who conducted Lee's post-mortem changed his assessment of the nature of her genital injuries after discussing the case with detectives. The updated assessment was that Lee had sustained such significant vaginal bruising because she was a virgin. Associate Professor Carrington's submission also claimed that the pathologist confirmed that there was forensic evidence that Lee had been a victim of multiple sexual assaults. She stated she'd also received advice from another forensic scientist that Lee's head injuries were inflicted from different directions by different weapons. One was obviously the rock, but the other appeared to have a flat surface like a plank of wood. The Royal Commission was clear that there was no conflict of interest regarding Justice Wood's previous involvement with the case. However, in December 1994, the request for reinvestigation was denied. But with Associate Professor Carrington's assistance, Robin persisted in her quest for answers. In May 1995, Robin appealed the victim's compensation payout she'd received two years earlier. As the compensation appeal was a civil case, the burden of proof was less than that in a criminal matter. The judge was therefore able to access information not presented at the criminal proceedings. This fuller account of the facts allowed the judge to comment on the full extent of the violence Lee had suffered. The judge hearing the matter noted in his assessment that Robin had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. She continued to struggle with depression, nightmares, and insomnia in amongst her grief. Jesse was also experiencing ongoing trauma, unable to forget that her sister was found dead on Jesse's seventh birthday. The judge commented that the highly distressing material about the events at the party led him to form the view that Nathan and Lee did not have consensual sex. The judge found Nathan to be an unreliable witness, commenting, The genital injuries to Lee 
show that there was very severe, violent and resistant invasion of her body, which was performed by persons which have not been detected. I do not believe the acts were committed at the same time, nor do I believe that they were related to each other. The acts were quite distinct and committed by different persons. The judge also noted the lack of convictions for the assault on Lee. Outside the surf club, he identified Jason Robertson and three other individuals as being involved, in addition to Matthew and Guy. The judge seriously questioned the role of the original investigation in absolving Matthew of any responsibility for sexual assault. His findings also supported Robin's concerns that more than one person was involved in Lee's murder. This was in stark contrast to Justice Wood's comments at Matthew's sentencing. But as the sexual assault charge didn't proceed, none of this evidence was presented. This meant Justice Wood could only comment on the murder charge. The judge upheld Robin's appeal, awarding her and Jesse an additional $134,048. The judge comments over Nathan's behavior reignited debate over his original charge and the investigation as a whole. In July 1995, the New South Wales Attorney General asked the New South Wales Police Minister to reopen the investigation. Things were gaining momentum. In May 1996, Newcastle Legal Center also prepared a submission requesting police to reinvestigate. The submission alleged that Lee was assaulted by up to nine people. It also stated that 16 people weren't charged in relation to offenses against Lee and other girls at the party, including four sexual assaults. Six months later, it was announced that the investigation would be reviewed by the New South Wales Crime Commission. In 1997, Matthew spoke to the media about the murder. He was still in jail, but he maintained that he acted alone when he killed Lee. The same year, Robin decided that she would no longer personally continue her campaign to have the case reopened. The overwhelming emotional and psychological exhaustion had taken its toll, and any strength Robin had left to continue the fight had been entirely depleted. She was forced to move house a second time in October 1996 due to ongoing harassment and threats. In March 1998, the Crime Commission released its findings. It found that some investigation methods utilized by Newcastle Police were indeed inappropriate but that no relevant facts were excluded for the purpose of sentencing. Even though Nathan had been charged with a less serious sex offense, the commission found that witness statements claiming that Nathan sexually assaulted Lee didn't meet the criminal standard to support the allegation. These were considered hearsay and therefore inadmissible in court, as Lee was unable to give evidence against Nathan. It was impossible to establish whether intercourse between the two teenagers was consensual. The commission concluded that Matthew acted alone and that police did not act inappropriately by not charging anyone else. The commission also rejected the allegation that Lee was sexually assaulted with a beer bottle. It recommended no further charges be laid due to the inconclusive and circumstantial nature of the available evidence, which couldn't sufficiently be corroborated in court. This appeared to be the end of the road for Robin. However, Expert opinions supporting the forensic evidence which contradicted Matthew's confession only raised further questions. It wasn't clear exactly how the commission concluded that Lee's sexual assault was consistent with Matthew's account. The review also failed to clarify whether the suspect's clothing was ever sent for testing. In the end, these shortcomings cast such doubt over several of the commission's other findings that the matter was referred to the New South Wales Police Integrity Commission. In April 1998, the Integrity Commission commenced its review by interviewing the investigating officers and witnesses, including Matthew, Guy, and Nathan. Associate Professor Carrington alleged that the full autopsy report was suppressed in the police brief of evidence for Matthew's murder charge, which amounted to withholding of evidence and falsifying records. Other records indicated that three days after Lee's murder, a blood sample, Lee's shorts and underwear, and the murder weapon were received by the forensics lab for testing. 
but the test results for these items weren't believed to have ever been released. There was nothing to indicate that another 31 items received by forensics were tested. Other allegations emerged regarding the police's treatment of the suspects. Matthew, Guy, and Nathan alleged that they were assaulted by the police during their original interviews. Matthew stated that when he refused to confess to murdering Lee, police repeatedly punched and kicked him. The nature of the suspect's arrest was also addressed. At the time, New South Wales did not have the power to arrest a person purely for questioning, which they did with all three suspects. As 15-year-old Nathan was a minor, police were also required to contact his parents prior to questioning him, but this didn't occur until he was later formally interviewed. The findings released by the Integrity Commission in October 2000 were comprehensive. It was determined that the full medical report of the postmortem was, in fact, submitted as part of the brief of evidence for Matthew's murder charge and sentencing, and nothing relevant was excluded. It was revealed that the blood sample, Lee's clothing, and the murder weapon were the only items out of a total of 35 that were received that indicated some form of staining. They were therefore the only items considered relevant to the brief of evidence for the murder charge. This was why the other 31 items, including the clothing collected from Matthew, Guy, and Nathan, weren't tested. The pathologist was not found to have changed his opinion due to police pressure. He referred to a conversation with the associate professor Carrington in 1994, where he explained that Lee's genital injuries were consistent with both Nathan's and Matthew's versions of events. He also clarified that the lack of semen on Lee's body did not support the allegation that she had been sexually assaulted by more than one person. Overall, the Integrity Commission concurred with the review by the Crime Commission it found no evidence of police misconduct in decision-making processes regarding the nature of the charges laid, or of a failure to charge anyone else. The Integrity Commission found that police didn't withdraw the sexual assault charge against Matthew, but that the prosecutors decided not to proceed on the basis of the evidence. The commission explained its reasoning, saying, It is not unusual under current practice for prosecutors to accept a plea to a principal charge of murder and subsume into the facts the other offenses committed upon the victim immediately before the killing. The commission found that the police had no influence on the prosecution's decision and confirmed that no further charges were to be laid. When it came to the poor communication between the police and Robin Lee regarding her concerns, the commission concluded that it was unclear whether this represented an attempt to obscure improper police actions or a failure to appreciate the needs of the family of the victim. Despite the bulk of the findings supporting the decisions of Newcastle Police, the commission substantiated 10 types of police misconduct, concluding, The conduct of the police created the potential for the loss of critical evidence. There was no question that the prosecution's entire case hinged on Matthew's confession, but as his arrest was determined to be unlawful, the way the investigation was conducted meant that his confession would have been inadmissible in court, given the lack of any other evidence against Matthew. Had the matter gone to trial, the exclusion of his confession would have resulted in a not guilty verdict. As far as the allegations that police assaulted the suspects, the review determined that it was likely that Matthew had been assaulted while detained. No determination could be made about whether Nathan was assaulted and Guy's allegation was not substantiated. The commission recommended that Detective Chaffee be dismissed for gross dereliction of duty, that criminal prosecution be considered for five officers, and that four officers be subject to disciplinary action. In the end, Detective Chaffee retired before his dismissal could be formalized. He was outspoken in defending himself and his team. Prosecutors eventually decided to not proceed with the charges against the other officers, citing emotional hardship and the fact that the review had effectively put an end to the officers' policing careers. Matthew Webster's initial parole application in February 2004 was denied, but four months later, after serving 14 and a half years, he was released. Prior to this decision, Robin Lee wrote to the parole board saying, Matthew's actions that night have affected so many innocent people. Both his and our families have been devastated by this tragedy. 
Matthew's parole conditions prevented him from visiting Stockton and the greater Newcastle area. He couldn't return to live there for at least six years. Matthew couldn't stay out of trouble, though, and returned to prison five months later when his parole was revoked after he was arrested for assaulting a man the previous month. He pleaded not guilty on the grounds of self-defense, but the charge was dropped due to a lack of sufficient evidence. Matthew was eventually released from prison in May 2005. Despite the many ways in which the lives of Lee's family have been irrevocably changed, there is no doubt they conducted themselves with remarkable resilience and dignity. Robin continued to look forward. Reflecting on the way Lee's death impacted the family, she told the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, I don't look for blame. There's no use in that. I feel sorry for Matthew's parents. They must be going through hell. We're all going through hell. Sometimes, I just don't have the answers. But I know, I have to be positive. There is a future, and it is up to me to make it a good one. Listener what do you think about how the events in today's story unfolded? As you've heard, there is no question that the mainstream media and the sentencing judge in Lee's case perpetuated a victim-blaming narrative, focusing on Lee's behavior and her family's responsibility in avoiding such a tragedy. Yes, someone did go to jail, but there were no winners here. The difference between what feels moral and just the limitations of the law and holding people accountable means that punishment doesn't always fit the crime. For victims' families, it can feel like a gross injustice and a wound that will never heal. Sometimes, for a range of reasons, the moral victory we're hoping for never materializes. And I think that wraps things up. Thank you for listening and keep the fire burning.